or like show dogs <laughs> trotting across the stage. Um, thanks so much for uh, being here, everybody. My name is Laura Bliss. I'm a reporter at Bloomberg News and really um, thrilled to be back in the beautiful Craneway Pavilion for this uh, event, all in person. It's very exciting. Um, so this is really the primary public policy panel of the day. And we're going to be talking about how the pandemic has really presented serious challenges to transportation authorities in cities, how to keep city dwellers moving, uh, without endangering their health or flooding the streets with cars. In many parts of the world, e-bikes, scooters, and other micro-mobility uh, modes have played an outsized role in addressing those questions, um, even as the industry, the micro-mobility industry, has been challenged to weather this ongoing crisis that's left lasting dents in the way traffic patterns play out across the hours of the day, um, and for many people, their willingness to use shared modes. So we're going to be exploring today how uh, public and private sectors have evolved their relationship over the last year and prior to that as well, um, and what challenges still remain uh, in, the, in those relationships. So to do that, I'm joined by a really fantastic uh, panel of folks, and I will go ahead and let them introduce themselves to you all. Thanks, Laura, and hi, everyone. My name is Deb Schrimmer. I'm with Lyft. We operate shared bikes and scooters across uh, 15 markets across the country, and I lead our policy development and research for our micromobility division. How you doing? I'm Vivian Mertides. I work with Hellbiz, handling partnerships and policy. I've been in micromobility for about three years, previously worked at Lime and at Spin and joined Hellbiz a couple of months ago and really excited for this opportunity to be together and see lots of friendly faces and meet lots of new friends. Hi, I'm Danae Evans. I work for the City of Richmond Transportation Department. I'm a transportation services project manager responsible for curb management and shared mobility programs. Welcome to the City of Richmond. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kirby Olson. I work for a five-year-old startup in the mobility space. We're called the Oakland Department of Transportation. Um, and I manage all of the shared mobility programs for the city of Oakland. So bike share, car share, scooter share, et cetera. Fantastic. So I'd love to start off um, just with a little bit more historical perspective, going back a full three to four years. Um, and, and kick this to, to Vivian and Debs. Um, from your perspective on the uh, private sector side of things, how has the relationship between cities and mobility startups um, changed since those rough and tumble days of the ride hailing apps kind of coming into cities without a lot of warning or preparation or any of that? I'll jump right in. Um, it has evolved a lot. I'm really thankful for um, the patience of a lot of um, cities and regulators. Uh, frankly, in the beginning, there were many cities that were not interested. They were kind of shell-shocked from the experience they had from um, the rideshare industry, quite frankly. And, you know, I think that what has worked is a willingness for us to work together as partners to understand what the challenges are, what the concerns are, and evolve uh, really as an industry in understanding that sidewalk clutter is a real concern. People are worried that, you know, riding down uh, the sidewalk might cause problems for folks in wheelchairs, for instance. And so really having an open dialogue and understanding we're here to work collaboratively, um, I've really seen uh, great relationships build over the last couple of years. Yeah, just, just to build on that, I mean, at Lyft, you know, some of our bike share systems have actually been around for a decade plus at this point. And so, um, the last few years, you know, new modes like the scooters and, and dockless bikes um, have certainly forced new conversations about how do we interact with these modes, but, but micro-mobility has been around for, for a while, and, and our capital bike share system and our nice ride system uh, turned 10 years old last year. I think what's What's really exciting about kind of where we are right now as an industry, though, is we're actually seeing um, sort of like a rationalization of uh, how these systems operate in cities. Um, you know, a few years ago, the time horizon you're talking about, uh, cities were really using a, a permit model uh, where multiple operators could build, uh, you know, a, a proposal, and if they meet the qualifications, they can operate in the city, and this led to a model where you would have five or six scooter operators uh, operating in the city on a very short time horizon. And, and what we've seen uh, over these last few years is that that model doesn't always work necessarily, and there's been this rationalization where um, 
the, the permit process has been extended from a six month to one year program to one, two, even five years in some places. And, and cities are starting to realize that maybe like the public-private partnership model, uh, which Lyft sees a lot in our bike share systems, can be a really good example uh, to, to continue this uh, you know, micromobility uh, industry moving forward. Thank you for that. I want to come back to the kind of evolution of the Free-for-all is kind of the wrong word, right? But like multiple operators kind of competing for permits versus the more sole proprietor model. Um, I think it's something everyone here has something to say about. Um, but but to, to go over to Kirby and Danae, um, talk a little bit about, about, about the how the pandemic, the last 18 months, has kind of changed the outlook among cities on micromobility as a mode and, and kind of the, the roles it can fulfill. I can start. Um, so yeah, I mean, the pandemic has been just devastating for shared mobility, at least in Oakland. I think um, primarily because our, our biggest use case for shared mobility is people getting to BART, our mass transit system, and uh, BART ridership was down 90%. I think at the moment it's down around 75%. So that's you know hundreds of thousands of people that are no longer taking trips to a BART station, uh, which in shared mobility is like the perfect thing to take to BART, right? Um, so, you know, but at the same time, there have been a lot of, um, you know, a lot more bicycling, especially recreational trips. So similar to how I think uh, a lot of companies and the industry is shifting a little bit towards ownership models, um, at the city, we've been thinking about how do we support ownership of shared mobility devices. So um, one, one way that we're trying to do that and something I'm going to announce for the first time here um, is that we got a $1 million grant to do an electric bike library. So we're going to buy 500 e-bikes uh, and make them available at very low cost uh, through our local, local bike shops. Uh, all kinds of e-bikes, so cargo bikes, adaptive bikes for people with disabilities, uh, folding bikes, etc. Um, and you know, let people have them for weeks to potentially even months. Um, at, at very low cost. So that's sort of one of, one of the pivots that, that we're doing at the city. So in Richmond, um, I noticed a, a direct um, correlation to the lack of or the, the reduced bus line services in our city and the need to get people around. Unfortunately, um, right before the pandemic, we were going to roll out our first e-bike share program uh, funded by the MTC uh, Capital Bike Share um, funds and what you'll see, you probably see them out here today, but they're the Gotcha bikes. And um, unfortunately, um, during COVID, Gotcha had some issues and they, they were acquired by another company called Bolt Mobility. But um, through their patience and the commitment from the city of Richmond, we kind of we went through the process and we, uh, we basically took the hit, so to speak, and we, we remained flexible. And I'm happy to say that we launched our bike share, our e-bike share program just this June 15th. So you will see some bikes out here, but I will say that the pandemic um, exposed to us the need for the, the bike share because people were reluctant to take the bus. They were reluctant to go on BART and they were reluctant to do the lift, um, you know, the, the car share programs. If you don't mind, I'll jump in there a second. And as a vendor um, and a partner in many cities, we saw that that challenge. And many cities stepped up and said, you know what, we see scooters as an, op as an option and opportunity to replace some of those trips on a bus. Um, people were concerned, didn't really know what was going on and felt more comfortable riding in open air in a scooter. And on the, on the same hand, we, saw, we found some cities that were just didn't really know what was going on. So we, we, we saw both sides of that coin, but really many, many cities, more than not, saw them as an opportunity to replace um, to the buses and to, to provide alternate transportation in a time of uncertainty. It was um, a great partnership that in, in most of the vendors provided uh, free rides to healthcare workers and things like that to make sure that essential workers had a way to get to work and get to hospitals. Yeah, just to, to sort of build on that lift, 
ran a critical workforce program and across the country we gave out uh, free memberships to bikes and scooters. We had about 36,000 memberships and it really actually changed the demographics of who's using micromobility. Uh, we found of, of those riders, about 80% of them were brand new to micromobility showing uh, that there's this like untapped demand of people wanting to use these services for the, the same time. And, and from a demographics perspective, um, many of the participants of our critical workforce program were female riders. In fact, in New York, in our city bike system, 67% of uh, riders in the critical workforce program were women. And, and you know, for anyone that's been in the industry for a while, where we know that there's these gender uh, disparity of who's using these systems, that was really tremendous. And that's something that we want to continue to build on and hope that this isn't just a, a blip in time, but uh, a demographic that we can continue to support um, moving forward. I want to put another pin in, in, in this question of how other modes of transportation affect micromobility you know, use patterns, because there's really interesting things to explore over the last 18 months with that. Um, but I do want to return to, to Kirby and this extremely exciting announcement with the e-bike library, but also kind of talk a little bit about you know, the conditions that led to that, right? Oakland has seen, is it six micromobility startups co come and go in the last couple of years? Um, and, and it sounds like Danae, right, has seen some of the, you know, the challenges of, of that kind of multi-vendor model, right? Um, and, and it does seem like there's this evolution to the, the sole proprietor uh, approach, or perhaps in this case, you know, a city simply stepping up and, and kind of going it alone. Um, so I'd love you to talk a little bit more about that. I mean, do you see this kind of as a trend with, with other um, colleagues on the public sector side? Yeah, I mean, it's a dogfight, right? The one-year permit um, is, is, really, is really tough. And uh, yeah, we've seen at least six shared mobility uh, companies come and go in the city of Oakland, if not more. Um, and that has, you know, it has a lot of detrimental effects, right? Like you have a company come in, they get a warehouse, they start to learn about the city, uh, people start to rely on the service, and that's the thing that's sort of most disheartening to me when we have an operator leave is that there's customers, you know, in Oakland that, that this is how they get to work or how they get to wherever they're going. Um, so yeah, I, personally, I would love to see a longer term, more steady partnership. Of course, that means there's probably going to be less innovation in the space, right? Because you're not going to have new companies bringing in uh, fresh ideas and fresh types of vehicles and things like that. Um, you know, with 10-year contracts, you kind of, you get what you get and there's, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not as much room for innovation. There's not as many mechanisms to force innovation at the same time. Um, so one, one example of that is that uh, we required locking mechanisms on our scooters um, a couple of years ago. And so that meant that we you know, were able to really almost practically solve the sidewalk obstruction issue and solve the uh, scooters being thrown into Lake Merritt issue. Um, and that's something we probably wouldn't have been able to enforce if we had a 10-year contract. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll make a comment on kind of the flip side. In, and I agree with you in a multi-year contract actually in my opinion, can help bring innovation as well because we'll make the commitment to the city, we'll make the commitment to the innovation and the dollar spend because we know we're going to be there for a while. And at any point, in any contract, as we all know in government, it's kind of at the pleasure in many cases of, of the contract and of the city. So if we're not doing a good job and we're not bringing the innovation you want, you know, then in 90 days, six months, you can kill that contract. And so I agree the limited um, vendor model is, is much better for, um, for cities, for vendors, for riders, and a multi-year contract as well, in my opinion, gives us an opportunity to make that commitment to the community, not just in an R&D effort, but, but in the community itself. And, and at Help is, you know, we all have W-2 employees who are part of the community, who shop at your grocery stores, who, you know, have a vested interest in succeeding. And, and so we too would prefer the, the multi-year contract so we can become partners on a long term. Okay, I'll speak to our current contract with Gotcha. Um, one of the benefits of being a small city and I guess last to the party is we get to glean from other organizations and learn some of the best practices. And in so doing, we decided to um, contract with Gotcha because they had multiple modalities of travel so that we can expand. It is a multi-year contract, but it's also a public-private partnership so that beyond the contract term, they can stay in our city and it can be sustainable. And so I, I do definitely um, recommend that. However, um, the city of Richmond is agnostic. We are open to 
um, working with other companies, especially if they can fill a niche that isn't currently filled. And so we remain open and flexible to that as well, but we like the, the, the control and the constraint of having this long-term partnership. If, if I can just jump in, I, th I think what's kind of interesting is earlier we were talking about the pandemic and some of the, the real uncertainty that caused for, for residents being able to rely on uh, devices being available. And, and there's some really interesting research that comes from NAPSA, the North American Bike and Scooter Share Association. And they, they basically found that during the height of the pandemic in markets uh, with bike share, 14% uh, of bike share operators uh, left during the pandemic, whereas with scooters, 57% uh, of scooters uh, left at the height of the pandemic. And while 75% of those services did return at the end of the year, uh, I think it's a really interesting question about why those numbers look so different. And I don't think it's because of the form factor of the vehicles. It's really tied to the contracting structure and, and how those systems operate. And, and in the public-private partnership model, uh, you can't just leave uh, like that. And it really creates the stability and, and durability of being able to keep residents able uh, to relying on those services. And in, in, in you know, our markets, we were really able to step up and, and play that role. We were able to work in New York with NYC DOT to be able to adapt the system in real time and move stations to hospitals to support that demand. Or in San Francisco, um, when you know, travel behaviors really changed, uh, we were able to bring service across the entire city. And, and there's really that vested interest in staying. And, and I think it really does come back to that public-private partnership model. I, I wanna just extend the opportunity to any, anybody on the panel right now. I mean, as we're talking about the kind of evolution in, in the contracting model and in kind of the you know, identification of this um, opportunity during the pandemic, even as the industry you know, was going, under, going through serious upheaval, um, I mean, what are some of the kind of remaining gaps uh, between sort of public and private sector side objectives, needs, desires, hopes, wishes um, that are, are kind of live for, for you all right now? I can start. So I think one of the big ones is, is service in disadvantaged communities. I, I think that's, that's huge in Oakland. Um, and so we're, we just recently launched our bus rapid transit service in Oakland between downtown Oakland and downtown San Leandro. Um, and you know, we, the scooter service in along that corridor and in, in East Oakland in general is just not nearly as robust as it is uh, in downtown or North Oakland or other, other parts of the city. Um, so one thing that we did and again, making an announcement here on the stage, is that we're launching a universal basic mobility pilot program. So we're basically gonna give people $100 a month to use for transportation services, uh, including transit, uh, scooter share, bike share, um, not, uh, not Lyft and Uber, sorry. But um, that, so that'll hopefully, you know, sort of stimulate the demand and then stimulate, you know, more service in that area. Um, so we can really help, help people fill those transportation gaps and get to uh, the bus rapid transit service to make their longer trips. Yeah, and I think, um, again, the public-private partner, public partnership um, and looking at innovative ways to look at fees or contracting, you know, maybe in areas where we know that there's a greater demand, um, you know, fees might be one amount, but maybe in another area or in a disadvantaged community, um, you know, we don't want to be necessarily penalized to deploy 15% of our scooters there when we're going to see, you know, a, a small turnaround where we want to make sure that maybe there's a lower fee or something that we can be partners and we all want to get to the right solution, but how does it make sense um, for both parties in the equation? Also thinking about um, this kind of perennial question of, of should cities or you know, other forms of government subsidize uh, micromobility services, and, and we've seen some examples of that in the last couple of years. I think Portland, right, is one example um, where you can actually speak to a little bit to, to this, uh, but where there's, I think, some tension still, right? Like, you know, do um, city residents want to see their tax dollars going to this mode that they may not be totally familiar with or, or really sure about? Um, but maybe you want to speak a little bit to that. Sure. So the specific Portland example is um, we, Lyft operates Bike Town, the system in Portland, and we run uh, a Bike Town for All program. And PBOT is actually helping subsidize the reduced fare 
Bike Town for All uh, program, uh, making it more affordable, being able to expand the eligibility of people that are able to use it. Uh, about a week ago, we actually uh, worked with PBOT and now uh, college students in Portland that are receiving financial aid are eligible for the Bike Town for All membership. But to, to your point or question around you know, public funding, I, I think absolutely public subsidies should, certainly should be uh, part of the conversation when we think about what the next decade of micromobility looks like. Um, and, and we subsidize transportation uh, modes. Like in this country, we, we subsidize roads and bridges. We subsidize transit. Uh, how many of you took the ferry this morning? <laughs> we subsidize the ferry. Uh, we subsidize car ownership uh, through you know, the lower fees for or free parking. Uh, and so I think we really have to ask ourselves, why are we not subsidizing what's often the fastest, most reliable, most affordable, most sustainable form of transportation? And, and that's micromobility. Uh, and, and to put it in perspective, <laughs> to put it in perspective, micromobility like, is operating like public transit. You've, we've heard the role that micromobility has played as a backstop to public transit during the pandemic. But frankly, it's also operating at a scale of public transit. If you were to look at the city bike system in New York uh, in 2019, city bike did over 19, or excuse me, over 21 million rides. That's from a ridership perspective compared to being like the 50th largest transit agency in the country. It's about as many rides as Sacramento Regional Transit did. And last year, City Bike did as many rides as Capital Metro, the system in Austin. And so I think sometimes it gets lost, uh, the true scale that these systems are operating at. And we need to think about uh, how we can expand uh, federal funding and change definitions uh, so that micromobility can be eligible for that funding. Yeah, and we're seeing in many of the cities um, we operate in, in um, previous companies I work with that we're really seeing uh, a, a mode shift and we're seeing folks getting out of their car, we're seeing them use it for first and last mile, and it's not just for joyriding. Sure, scooters are super fun, and I get that, but um, really it's, it's a, another mode of transportation that I think cities are understanding, um, and as the industry matures and as cities um, mature and, and the industry overall, we're really seeing that it can make a big impact. And, um, and I'm glad to see that that continued to change. Um, what, one thought on here and, and one thing to point out is just that, um, you know, when we subsidize bus service, that's a publicly owned utility, right? And so that's very different than subsidizing a privately owned scooter company, right? Because there's no profit involved in operating a bus service. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'd be happy to provide some, some public subsidy for shared mobility programs, but I would much rather it be in a sort of fee-for-service type of model rather than sort of throwing money into a black hole. Um, because when you give, you know, if you're just handing out money, you have no idea what it's going to go to, right? So, but on the other hand, if we have a type of uh, situation where, say, every scooter trip that gets someone to a BART station, BART subsidizes that trip by $1 or cuts, it, cuts the, you know, a check to the company for doing that in exchange for not having parking lots, right? Because exactly. parking lots and parking structures are incredibly expensive. So if they can replace the cost of operating this garage with getting people there being scooters, I think that makes a lot of sense. I saw Danae nodding vigorously. Anything you wanted to add to this exchange? No, I think he covered it. I mean, I'm thinking a bigger picture. I think first mile, last mile as well. And like in the city of Richmond, some of the things we're doing is we're trying to also implement other modes that would also support micromobility um, modes, such as we recently received a million dollar um, grant to um, implement our first electric um, on-demand local shuttle in the city. And what that does is it helps specifically the disadvantaged communities that are normally disconnected from the main um, transit um, islands to um, actually be a part of, you know, our transportation networking to get to where they can't get to. They can get jobs. And so those are some of the things that we're doing. We're also um, implementing um, electric car share um, service throughout the city. And one of the things that we, we are really um, interested in doing is making sure that they have bike racks on every vehicle and that they can accommodate all these uh, modes of travel so that anyone who may be on a scooter or a bike from one end of the city can jump on any form of transportation to get where they need to go. And I think it, it's really um, important, especially when you consider that 
Richmond in particular has the ferry and we have BART. And with our bike share, we're now gonna be connected to the North Bay because Marin County and Sonoma County are also going to join Gotcha Bike. So that opens up the world for a lot of people, um, especially in this part of the Bay Area. I wanna um, just stay on this theme of, of kind of the, in, you know, the play between different modes of transportation because at, at least from um, Lyft bike share numbers, I know I remember reading and, and kind of reporting on how um, you know, the cities that have seen some of the highest uptake um, of, of bike share, and, and I, I think this is perhaps indicative of other, other modes too, um, during the pandemic have been the cities with the highest sort of percentage of, of mode share for public transit, right? And so that, that kind of brings up sort of a, a related point, right? Which is that, you know, as folks have reduced their use of public transit in the last year and a half, they are switching to micromobility modes, right? Um, and in cities where there is less transit use, including in San Francisco and Los Angeles and, and kind of cities where there's higher, you know, car ownership rates, um, the ridership has not been, you know, nearly as high. Um, and and it's, it's fallen in, in um, certainly in the case of San Francisco. So anything else that this panel kind of wants to add about what we've learned, particularly in the last um, year and a half or so about that kind of interplay and, and, and what the implications are? I'll just say um, that we have seen a, a real increase in the time on a, of a ride. So, for instance, it might have, you know, been two or three or five minute rides before. Now we're seeing that, you know, 5x sometimes. You're seeing 15 minute, 20 minute rides. Um, I think sometimes people are using just to get out of the house. Quite frankly, earlier on, we saw long rides because people felt comfortable in it, again, in an open situation where they can just ride around town and get out of the house. Um, I think now they're using it more um, for transportation. Again, they've, they've found the utility in using um, scooters. And also we've seen um, an increase, quite frankly, in, in the numbers of uh, overall riders that we have. Um, I think, again, the, the pandemic with bikes and scooters and other things have found that people can get out of the cars. Um, it was an alternative when buses were shut down. And so we've really seen, I think, a, a growth in the industry and we'll continue to see that. Yeah, I think, um, so in Oakland, about 25% of our overall scooter trips are trips that are diverted from public transit. Um, and in some ways that's bad, right? Because there's less people riding the bus or riding the train, but Honestly, it doesn't bother me that much because people vote with their feet, right? They're taking the service that is the most useful for them for that particular trip that they're taking. And if public transit isn't competitive for that particular trip, then we should make it more competitive, right? And they can steal back some, some riders from scooters. Um, so yeah, I don't necessarily see it as a problem, but unfortunately, uh, you know, transit has not been invested in during the pandemic, right? We've seen service cuts instead of additional service, um, which is uh, obviously a shame. And hopefully, you know, with the federal infrastructure bills, we can get more funding into transit. Yeah, I think from Lyft's perspective, you know, this year, uh, our city bike system in New York has um, achieved like a record ridership date, a, m a, milestone, a milestone nine times over. Like we keep setting these new records and we're seeing in Chicago uh, similar record ridership levels. And uh, I, I think, you know, some of it is tied to what you're talking about with um, people, you know, shifting from public transit during the pandemic. But, but we actually know, like, our riders are multimodal and, and they do use public transit services and, and make that first last mile connection. We, we surveyed our riders across the country this year and 80% of our micromobility riders have used micromobility to connect with public transit. So I certainly think that uh, as, as we sort of move through this recovery process, like there will still be this opportunity um, for micromobility riders to use both those services. But one particular mode shift that I'm really excited about is um, the mode shift where people who are driving cars are switching to e-bikes. We, we operate pedal bikes, e-bikes, and scooters, and we see overwhelmingly uh, many people are much more likely to not own a car or get rid of a car or use their car less uh, with e-bikes. And we've been growing our e-bikes across the country. Um, we have some of our new e-bike here to, to test ride, and I'm, I'm really excited to see uh, the kind of mode shift in a sustainable direction that can come from e-bikes. Thank you all so much. Um, we are unfortunately at time, but the conversation will continue um, at the conference. So round of applause for our fantastic panel here.